Greetings and welcome to Mystery Babylon News Radio on the 27th of, Janu of, of November in 2013. Uh, uh, good evening, uh, uh, Belgium. Good morning, America. Yeah, yes. Well, uh, the the top the series that we're doing here is uh, the Jesuits derooting the Reformation. Anyway, I. Uh, do you, you go ahead and, uh, and, and start the broadcast, uh, York. Yeah, thank you, Wolf. Um, I'd like to start today with, uh, something that I put on my site where you can listen to this radio broadcast here. It's, uh, GrandDesignExposed.com, the Jesuit Collection. Uh, and, uh, we put up a PDF there that I translated from a German file, um, into English. And that is named, Why the German Flag is Upside Down. Uh, I have been a lot, uh, I've been busy a lot with the um, United States of America lately because we have also a broadcast of the Jesuit influence of the founding of America in uh, of the United States of 1776. And uh, also in America you have the discussion, is the flag upside down, have the stripes to be horizontal or vertical and all that stuff. And um, that's sometimes an interesting discussion where there are a lot of answers to. But I think there are not so many people who know that the German flag that you know as a black, red, gold today, black above, red in the middle, and gold in the end, um, that that was uh, turned around once uh, into gold, red, black. And i like to start our broadcast today by telling you a little bit about that. You know, the first German Reich that we already talked about in the uh, other episodes of this broadcast, uh, the uh, Holy Roman Empire of German nation, started, uh, ceased to exist in 1806 after the Napoleonic Wars. <clears throat> then there was, um, yeah, a little bit up and down and here and there, and there was a movement really to make a German nation state. It didn't come to that really that, uh, that soon, but uh, the movement was already there. So what I'm talking about now is uh, about something that happened on May 27th, 1832. Um, there were about 30,000 freedom-loving people from all layers of the society who gathered in the German province known as Palatinate for a manifestation that went in the history books as the Hambacher Fest. You can look that up when you Google it, Hambacher Fest. They came with flags that resembled the current national colors, but the reversed colors. That means gold on top, red in the middle and black in, uh, at the bottom. And they wandered from Neustadt on the Rheinstraße, which is a very nice uh, little town. I've been there because you can drink very nice German wine there. Uh, and they wandered to the castle of Hambach. Their main demands were the national unity as well as secured basic freedoms and citizen rights. Because, you know, what we take to granted, for granted today the so-called human rights, I mean, even though they are treated, uh, they are kicked anywhere, anyway, in, in the world, because um, the Jesuits don't care about the things they promised to us, but at that time, they had really absolutely no human rights, and, um, well, they were more known of being slaves than we are today, <laughs> exactly. But, you know, the best slave is the one who thinks that he's free, and today the people think they're free, so they are very good slaves. But that's not the point. Point being is, um, they really wanted uh, basic citizen rights, like uh, movement and, and social security and, and uh, all, all the stuff that just that you can go over the street and not be harmed by, uh, let's say. Um, so nothing special. But they, these were granted up to them. Uh, in relation to the idea of having a national state, these colors have first been showing up between the years 1815 and 1817. So that's about almost 20 years before this regarding the foundation of the first student fraternity at the University of Jena. Jena is a, a very nice town in today Middle Germany, or the former GDR, German Democratic Republic, uh, that came into the Federal Republic of Germany by the reunification in, uh, of 1990. So Jena is a very nice uh, old student town in, in the middle part of Germany, not really the eastern, but more the middle part of Germany. And paintings from that time show this colors in this order, and not unlike today, reversed upside down or even changed afterwards. According to the legend, these colors want to tell us the following. Into the golden future, on the top, through bloody battle, which is the present, from dark slavery, 
which is the past, or also the Dark Ages, as you know from uh, well, the very strong counter-reformation that came after uh, Martin Luther set up the Reformation in uh, 1520 with uh, uh, with um, translating the Bible into German, um, and then the counter-reformation that came mostly out of Bavaria in Germany. Bavaria was a very hardcore. Uh, Catholic states where even Protestants were, were killed for their beliefs and churches were closed and all that stuff. So they really wanted uh, a call for German unity, a resurrected empire, uh, and that was frowned upon at that time, actually. So, um, as is today, by the way, the confessions to German identity and history, because when you are a German, and you are so-called proud of being a German uh, and proud of your country, you're not a proud German, you're not a patriot, you're a Nazi. Nazi, Nazi, Nazi. That's all that they call you today. Anyway, the so-called powerful have arranged themselves with numerous German small states uh, and the big powers of Prussia and Austria. Um, it's probably interesting for you to know that at that time, Germany was not a nation state, that's why they fought for that, but it had four kingdoms. It had the Kingdom of Prussia, the Kingdom of Bavaria, the Kingdom of Saxony, and the Kingdom of Württemberg. Further, it had grand duchies, uh, the Duchy of Baden, the Duchy of Hessen, uh, mecklenburg schwerin mecklenburg strelitz Oldenburg, and Saxe-Weimar-Eisenach, which was uh, in the east. Then it also had four, uh, five duchies, and again, uh, seven different principalities, and in the end, last but not least, uh, three free Hanseatic cities, which are Bremen, Lübeck, and Hamburg. And Hamburg, the city where I come from myself. So, my nice connection to that one. So that was how Germany was um, was, was a part of that day. There was no nation state. There were different kingdoms and duchesses and principalities. You know. <coughs> so. Um, the so-called powerful have arranged themselves with numerous German small states, and I just summed up. Um, and the big powers, Prussia and Austria, this was not to be changed, and that is why these colors were forbidden. But because nobody was allowed to wear these colors, gold, red, and black, they were simply turned upside down. The authorities tolerated this black, red, gold, because only the gold, red, black version was prohibited, and they did not want to look ridiculous, and also appreciated the intelligence of the citizens. Well, <laughs> I wish the government of today would appreciate the intelligence of the few citizens that still have intelligence today, but that, that will probably stay just a dream. <laughs> okay, um, this factual fault order of the colors became the colors of the flag of the Weimar Republic, which succeeded uh, the Second German Reich after the defeat in World War I from 1919, uh, coming up to 1933, until the start of the Third Reich. Uh, the Occupied Federal Republic of Germany, and the Soviet Occupied German Democratic Republic. That was, um, uh, all these countries used the same color, black, red, and gold, like I said. <clears throat> also, the combined occupied management of the BRD, which um, uh, is West Germany, and the DDR, since 1990, uses the upside-down version of the national flag. So that's the Federal Republic of Germany, as you know it today. The difference between the powers then, in the Hamburg time, and now, is that the powers of today have even betrayed the real German unification, which can easily be proven by the numerous contracts and documents from the year 1990. So we are all told and taught all over the world that Germany is united and that Germany is a free, an independent, and sovereign state. Well, Germany is not a state. Germany is not free. Germany is still occupied. Uh, you can look that up. Germany is even still uh, an enemy state in the papers of the United Nations. Uh, Germany has never had a peace treaty, so there is no peace after the Second World War, and we are not a sovereign state. There are many, many papers that can prove that, and if you want to check that, you can come. I invite you to come to my channel on YouTube, uh, Jocklaw66. Uh, you will also find a link on the page of our radio broadcast here to my YouTube channel, 
And I hope that you then speak a little bit German because I have two playlists that uh, just uh, be, are busy with just this subject to tell the people uh, that Germany is uh, just a company and it's not a state um, and that's all the big big thing. So, can, can I ask a question, Jörg? Yeah, oh, of course. Y yes. Um, uh, in, other, in other words, uh, what you're saying is, you know, uh, the Holy Roman Empire – uh, Germ Germany didn't really exist, and so what they've done after the Third Reich, am I right by saying they've, in other words, uh, it, it, it's it's like you're being governed ag again by the Holy R Roman Empire? Yeah, I think the only little time that they were free of Rome is the time between 1871 and uh, 1918, and um, that is something that I will cover later on in this uh, broadcast today. Oh, okay, go ahead. Yeah. But, but for the moment, you have to understand that we, the Germans, still do not have a peace treaty, nor a constitution, nor are we a sovereign state. The flag hanging upside down, what can best be interpreted as, when you read it from top black, to enduring slavery and eternal dog bandage after bloody defeats and two world wars in red, from the golden past, from the empire. That's why the flag is upside down. If you ask me, I would really like to turn, the, uh, to turn the flag around again with the following symbolism. On top, gold into a golden future. In the middle, red with never-ending love. And on German soil, which is black, because soil is black. But, you know, as always, most of the time it's different from what you thought it would be. So think straight and clear and don't live in a hopeful world. But if you want to check that out, you can also go to this um, historic museum in the, in the Pfalz in Speyer, where this photo, uh, where this photo, where, where this painting of this uh, Hambacher Fest is hanging, and then you can check the flags uh, in that um, uh, in that direction: gold, red, and black, which I think many of you haven't even heard of that um, that existed, but that's the truth. It did. Also, so, I, I ask you yeah. that question: Don't you think that this 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 here is part of of the derooting of because uh, because of the Reformation because the reason why this series is called the Jesuits derooting the Reformation is the root the big root of the Reformation uh, is in Germany. Do, do you, don't you think I that's part? Of, I absolutely agree with that. In other words, no, it was, it was something uh, last night I had um, I had a long conversation and we made a few videos uh, with Alan Lamont. Mm -hmm. And uh, we were also talking about um, the uh, derooting uh, of, of, yeah, of, of Germany, the derooting of the Reformation. And what I put in there is something that you also have to think about. Uh, the Reformation really started to come out of Germany, and Germany was about to spread it all over the world, and therefore the Jesuits really want to uh, demolish Germany. They want to abolish it. They want to just wipe it off the earth. Um, but you have to think, or you have to consider the 1260 years before that happened. And uh, therefore, you have to know the story of the Valdenses. And uh, if you're interested in Protestantism, and if you're interested in the history of people who always uh, lived after the commandments of Jesus Christ and even died for it centuries long, uh, I can advise you very, very much to watch the documentary Israel of the Alps, you can find that in YouTube. Just Google it or type it in on YouTube and look it up. The Israel of the Alps. It is a three-part documentary about, I think all three parts together are about one hour and a half. And uh, there you can see the Valdenses that uh, they, they hid in, in Switzerland in the mountains for centuries. And from there came out and spread the word of Jesus all over Europe. They also went into Germany. And I personally do not think that the German Reformation would have been possible without the Valdenses, who were laying kind of a groundwork, uh, mostly in the underground, of course, because they were prosecuted and, uh, and chased after and killed and whatever. 
but um, I think that they laid a kind of a groundwork so that many people uh, who didn't have any books at that time, uh, the Bible wasn't translated, that's what the Reformation was. It was for the first time translated a book into the people's language, because up to that time, the people believed what the preachers told them out from the chancel in the, in the, in the church when they, when they went there, and they got a sermon upon, um, which they mostly got in Latin, and people did not speak Latin. They didn't understand it. So they believed that the priests uh, or the fathers or whatever they call themselves, fathers, of course, in the Catholic churches, uh, were telling them the truth, which, which they absolutely did not. So the Church of Jesus was always an underground church, and the Valdenses is a very, very interesting to story to uh, to keep in mind for that one. Mm-hmm. And uh, they, I, I, I think, also comment. laid, laid, the, laid the ground for the for the Reformation that later came out of Germany. Yeah, sorry, what you wanted to say? Something? Yeah, yes, I, I just want to say, um, uh, uh, Tom Fress of Inquisition Update has been on Lori's Talk News Radio every Thursday. And uh, for the last four, for the last month, he's been reading the history of the Waldeans, and it's been a very uh, it's everything that you're talking about is kind of you know he's reading right out of the book. So that there's another source, and like myself, I'm interested in looking that up myself. Uh, uh, at Google search on Israel of the Alps will will give you a, a, also a video. So that's the comment I had. Mm-hmm. Okay, but um, so now we have been busy again uh, with the first uh, first German Empire, and uh, now with the flag, you understand what was a little bit going on in the uh, in the, in the uh, 1800s in Germany, and that's when, <clears throat> after all, um, the at the end of uh, the 19th century, there was finally the foundation of a German national state. Yeah. Um, and this uh, this German national state that was funded in uh, uh, 1871 uh, existed from 1871 under uh, founded under the uh, German Chancellor uh, Bismarck Otto von Bismarck, who I later have a very interesting quote on to tell you from what what he thinks of his German people. And I can tell you he's not wrong with that. Uh, and that uh, right ceased to exist in 1918 after the First World War. So now I'm going to take a little bit my time to uh, read about this German Empire. And uh, then I will take a few minutes break. And um, uh, Walt will play a little uh, audio that you can listen to from, uh, what's the sky we're called? CT... Um, I don't know his last name. Uh, uh, CT, he, uh, this, uh, he's the author of the Transformation of the Republic. Uh, yes. C. T. Walf, uh, Walcox. Ah, oh, Walcox. Yeah, yeah, a Canadian, huh? right? Yes, a Canadian. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So I, I, I will just uh, give you a little word when, when when you can play that, and uh, now I want to start with the foundation and tell the people how the German Reich actually was funded. Okay. Uh, okay. So the German Empire, uh, which you call in German Deutsches Reich or Deutsches Kaiserreich is actually the common name given to the state officially known German Reich, or literally the German realm. Yeah. Um, designating Germany uh, from the unification of Germany and proclamation of Willem I as German emperor on January the 18th, 1871. That's a very interesting date. When you listen to our other broadcasts, you know that January 18th, 1871, the Germans went into uh, the castle of Versailles near Paris and let the French sign the peace treaty after the German-Franco War from 1870 to 1871. And that was, of course, the time when uh, Wilhelm I as German emperor was inaugurated. Uh, So to 1918, when it became a federal republic, which was called the Weimarer Republic, because they didn't even dare to go to Berlin, that was called Weimar Republic, the Berliner Republic. Um, after defeat in World War One and the adaptation of Emperor Wilhelm II, the German Empire consisted of 27 constituent territories, most of them ruled by royal families. While the Kingdom of Prussia contained most of the population and most of the territory of the Reich, 
the Prussian leadership became supplanted by German leaders and Prussia itself played lesser role. As Dwyer points out, uh, Prussia's political and cultural influence had diminished considerably by the eight, 1890s. Its three largest neighbors were the rivals Imperial Russia to the east, France to the west, and ally Austria-Hungary to the south. Germany industrialized rapidly after 1850 with the foundation in coal, iron, and later steel, chemicals, and railways. From uh, a population of 41 million people in 1871, it grew to 68 million in 1913. From a heavily rural nation in 1815, it was now predominantly urban. During this, uh, its 47 years of existence, the German Empire operated as an industrial, technological, and scientific giant, receiving more Nobel Prizes in science than Britain, France, Russia, and the United States combined. So that is really when I sometimes say, well, you know, the Germans are a people of thinkers and inventors. I mean, where does the car come from that was invented by uh, Mr. Daimler? Where does the combustion engine come from? That was an invention by Mr. Otto. That's why we call it the Otto motor or the Otto engine. We have also from Rudolf Diesel the diesel engine or the gasoline engine that you know. So there were a lot of inventions, uh, a lot of things really that came from Germany uh, and that were made at that time. Yeah? It became a great power boasting rapidly growing rail network, the world's strongest army, and the fast-growing industrial base. Um, its navy went from being negligible sorry, <laughs> uh, to second only behind the Royal Navy in less than a decade. After the removal of the powerful Chancellor Otto von Bismarck in 1890, the death of Emperor uh, Wilhelm I, the young Emperor Wilhelm II engaged in increasingly reckless foreign policies that left the empire isolated. Its network of small colonies in Africa and the Pacific paled in comparison to the British and French empires, and only a small number became profitable. When the Great Crisis of 1914 arrived, it had only two weak allies, the Austro-Hungarian and the Ottoman empires. In World War I, uh, it plans to quickly capture Paris in 1914, failed uh, at the Western Front against Britain and France, became a stalemate. The Allied naval blockade made for increasing shortages of food, and Germany was repeatedly for forced to send troops to bolster Austria and Turkey for, uh, on other fronts. However, Germany had great success on the Eastern Front as a result of the Communist determination to end Russian involvement in World War I, it carved out large eastern territories following the Treaty of Brest-Litovsk. German declaration of unrestricted submarine warfare in early 1917 was designed to strangle the British. It failed because of the use of transatlantic convoy system. But the declaration, along with the Zimmerman telegram, did bring the United States into the war. The declaration, well, I think that mean here the Balfour Declaration, because the Balfour Declaration brought the United States into the war. Um, with its large reserves of money, food, armaments, and soldiers. Meanwhile, German civilians and soldiers had become radicalized by the Russian Revolution. The high command under Paul von Hindenburg and Erich Ludendorff increasingly controlled the Reich as they gambled on one last offensive in spring 1918 before the Americans could arrive in force, using large numbers of troops and guns withdrawn from the Eastern Front. It failed by, an October, uh, by October, the armies were in retreat, the Austro-Hungarian Empire and Ottoman Empire had collapsed, and the German people had lost faith in the political system. The empire collapsed overnight in the November 1918 revolution, as all the royals abdicated and the republic took over. Well, that is not so true, because not just the republic took over, there was also trying to declare Germany uh, a communist state by Karl Liebknecht and Rosa Luxemburg. I think you maybe heard of these people before, or you have not, then you can look them up, Rosa Luxemburg and Karl Liebknecht. Um, there were many uproars in Hamburg, for example, uh, and, and in Kiel, in northern Germany, 
Um, the Navy soldiers stood up and uh, had, a, had a riot going on. Uh, there was really kind of a turmoil time uh, there in Germany. But um, I'd like to intervene right now with a little uh, quote that I will read you from Bismarck, our chancellor, who, by the way, uh, twice escaped an attack on his life, uh, the first in, seven, in 1874 and the second uh, during his um, time uh, where he was chancellor, I think that was 1886. And he had to resign because of differences with the emperor in 1890. And died some years after that near Hamburg, uh, in Uhlenhorst, uh, Uhlen. No, it's not Uhlenhorst. I, I don't remember the name right now. But I, I was there several times. So, the quote from Bismarck. The urge to serve foreign interests, even if only possible by abandoning national interests, is a sickness that is geographically limited to German territory. I hope you all understood that well. If not, I will later repeat it again, and now then uh, uh, yeah. you can play your audio if you want to. Say your? Yeah. Yes, could, could, you, could you say that quote again and explain that? so we understand what Bismarck was saying? Yeah, okay. The urge to serve foreign interests, even if only possible by abandoning national interests, is a sickness that is geographically limited to German territory. Well, ex explaining this is maybe, the, the easiest way to explain this is maybe by uh, quoting uh, Napoleon, we have the following to say about the Germans, and then I'm going to give an explanation about these two, but I think this is quite kind of self-explanatory. Quote, there is no more good-natured, but not easily more believing people than the German. No lie can be conceived broadly enough, the Germans believe it. The slogan which was given them, they pursued their countrymen with greater bitterness than their real enemies. End quote. That is what Napoleon wrote in his biography. Again, can, can I, uh, 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 what, what I read into this is this. The German people were being used by other countries for, yes. for, their, for, their national, for their national interest, where the Germans were not allowed to use, were not allowed their uh, ability for their own national nationality because like before Napoleon they still weren't a nation is that is am I saying that right yeah they only became a nation in 1871 yeah and, and there, was, there was something like the German spirit let's say that was kind of Germany what uh, Germany wasn't a, a national state it yeah. just became a nation state in 1871 for the first time before that we don't speak about uh, German being a nation state well in, in the point that I uh, that I'm that I'm I want to see uh, I want to bring out here is is what Napoleon said. The, the, how did he say that? Can you go back to that? Napoleon said that the, the German people are good people. There's, yeah, there's no more good natured, but not easily more believing people than the German. So, so in other words, and and you, you know, uh, that, in other words, the good nature of somebody, you know, people people don't want to think that they have been. Uh, in other words, a good-natured, wholesome person. They were easy. What what he was saying, they were easily swayed. Is that right? Yes. Yes. In, in other words, it's uh, and, and it means that they are that they are good people. You can tell anything, and they will believe anything. They are easy believing. And when you when you say when you tell to them that their neighbor is a bad man, they believe this, and they will pursue him without even asking. And don't 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 you don't you think uh, too that that um, America has had that? Look at the national interest that America has been put on them that we're supposed to take care. I mean, all our foreign foreign affair foreign aid and stuff. I mean, I don't want to go down a bunny trail here, but I want to bring this out because this is very important when we come up to the Third Reich. Mm -hmm. How the German people. Uh, in, in other words, give you, an ex give you an example so the Americans here can understand what, what, what we're talking about here. Prior to World War, but, uh, prior to World War II, seventy percent of America did not want to have a war in Europe, and Roosevelt 
said on his reelection that our boys will not fo fight on foreign soil. But, in other words, if you tell them there's a boogeyman, in other words, they, 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 they we, we had Pearl Harbor and the whole country jumped on the bandwagon. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. In other words, in other words, but that, uh, sorry to interrupt you here, but this really brings something up that I, that I really have to say here, because when you're talking about also about the Second World War, there's a quote from Göring at the Nuremberg trials. I read it to you earlier, I think, Walt, mm -hmm. but I don't think that our listeners uh, have heard it yet. And this really connects to what we were just saying. So uh, maybe can I, can I try, take just this two minutes to read this quote? Sure, sure. Okay. okay. Göring, at the Nuremberg trials in 1946, uh, before he took this pill of cyanide and killed himself, why, of course, the people don't want war. Why would some poor slob on a farm want to risk his life when the best he can get out of it is to come back to his farm in one piece? Naturally, the common people don't want war, neither in Russia nor in England, nor in America, nor for that matter in Germany. That is understood. But after all, it is the leaders of the country who determine the policy, and it's always a simple matter to drag the people along, whether it is a democracy, or a fascist dictatorship, or a parliament, or a communist dictatorship. Voice or no voice, the people can always be brought to the bidding of the leaders. That's easy. All you have to do is tell them they are being attacked and denounce the pacifists for lack of patriotism, and exposing the country to danger. It works the same way in any country. And, and, End quote. And now think about what that did to America with 9-11. That's where I was going next. Of that's, course. <laughs> I know you won't. Uh, go, go, Goring, Goring's statement that he made is, is, is just as uh, alive today as when he spoke it. And uh, the reason we're not see we're going to be going to the to the Third Reich, and uh, this is the fourth broad, broadcast, and we're we're talking about the First and Second Reich, and uh, uh, but it's good to bring this out to so so to to touch upon these topics because when we get to the Third Reich, you'll see what happened to Germany. The same thing happened to Germany that happened to us when they when they. They did the false the, the false flag of, of of the Pearl Harbor. I mean, the whole country jumped on the bandwagon, grabbed the flags, whipped the flags around, and everybody went down with and, and within a I think it was within a 24-hour period they had a million volunteers to go to go to war. Yes, and you know when you think about it, it is not that surprising that the Americans are that way. In because because more than 46 million of your American citizens that you have, the majority are of German descendants. That's right. Good. So when when you when you when you read what Bismarck said about the Germans, when you read what Göring said about the Germans and about people going to war anyway. Because it's never people that go to war, it's always the governments that go to war and sending their people because they are so stupid to follow. Uh, and when you read what Napoleon said about the Germans, you can always take a big part of that and say that's not only the Germans, but also the Americans. That is I mean, the Americans like to stand there with their, I don't know, three quarter of a liter Coke singing stars and stripes, hallelujah, kumbaya, how great is our country, and that's, that's just the same, the, same, the same Germans wear. And that's exactly, that, that's exactly what we're trying to bring, bring out. That same sentiment, that same thing happened in the 30s with the, with the rise of the, of, of the National Socialist Party. Because, and, but let's take this a little bit further here, York. 
where did this spirit come from? I mean, I mean, it, it, the, Germany was the was in the heart. I mean, of of the Roman Holy Roman Empire, where church and state were one, and they ruled with a. With, I mean, you, you didn't say anything against the king or queen or the pope, or you had a knock on your door. And see this, this, this when 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 the spirit of Christ, the Reformation, the lamp of dark, the, the the light, the light, because of the because of the of the of the printing of the of the Bible and the Reformation. I mean, there was a spirit there. What what and what we're saying here is. You know, people can be led. See, people can be led, and that's where we're going. I'm not going to go any further on that because we want to stay to what we're, our topic here. But uh, this is real important to understand when we get it, when when we start talking about the Third Reich. That, that's what I had to say. Yeah, yeah, that's all right. Yeah. No, the point the point being that. Um, Germans and Americans are not that uh, that much different from each other. That's that's right. Now I got I got to I got to put this in here right now. I, I've said this before on other broadcasts, but <clears throat> my dad was a hundred percent German, and he and he went to Europe, and I was out building B equipment in my in my shed. And I had a friend come by, and he knew, and he, I was listening to some religious tapes. And he said, Walt, could you tell me, Walt, why your da your dad was a German, right? I said, yeah. He was a Ger he was We were Lutherans. I was raised a Lutheran. Why did your dad go to Germany and shoot and kill German Protestants, German Lutherans? See, understand the title of this broadcast is The Jesuits Derooting the Reformation. What a better way than to have two Germans, two Protestants, a Protestants against a Protestant, killing each other. The same with the English. Same with the English. And n not only that, we can say that, don't, uh, say that we're, we're trying to be a religious bigots. What about an American Catholic coming over during World War II and shooting German Catholics? Now, so the, the Jesuits, it's all the same because they don't care about Catholics, Protestants, or whatever. They, they only care about themselves, and they're Satanists. They're, and they're Satanists. And in other words, this is what we're, we're, we're working to. And this is where we're coming when we're coming to the Third Reich. I mean, they have brainwashed the world with so much indoctrination on what happened in World War II. And the point of it is the Jesuits derooting the Reformation. You see, it was the Jesuits that were engineering this German, a German Lutheran shooting and trying to kill a German Lutheran on their soil. Yeah, and I mean, you know, nowadays, nowadays, the, the biggest problem of the Jesuits is the United States of America, which is still full of Protestants who are armed to the teeth, and that is why you are going to have a very, very big problem with very full FEMA camps all over there, because that is up to, up to today the biggest Protestant nation on the world, the United States of America. And yes, and and we might realize we, we as we come into this era, you see, uh, uh, that's why we're talking about this history is to get to people to understand that everything that we are seeing that happened in all this war the last hundred years is about the Reformation, Counter Reformation, and that is the reason why you hear talk of FEMA camps is because they want to stomp, stamp out the last bastion of any kind of Protestantism. 
When this country was founded, it was founded on religious freedom. Now you tell me, and Charles Carroll, John Carroll, and Daniel Carroll, some of the the biggest movers, where in the world and history has the Roman Catholic Church ever been for freedom of religion? That is what we want, especially when we have Americans listening to this. You have to understand that who, why we see what we see today and with the Patriot Act is that's Roman that's Roman canon law. They have all the laws into place for the next Inquisition. Because this is the last bastion of Protestantism, and where did it start? Where it's reason again, we call it the derooting of the Jesuit Reformation, because the root of this came from Germany. Yeah, and um, I just want to go back again to the quote that I wrote, uh, that I read from Bismarck. Now, really, impersonate yourself on that, I think. I, I don't say that right. Just in, instead of Germans, think it's, uh, think it's uh, for once how the Americans are today. The urge to serve foreign interests. What interests does America serve for the moment? The interests of Netanyahu and Israel and the Zionists that rule your country. It seems like that. Behind the Zionists, there is, of course, the hidden power that we are trying to expose here, the Jesuits. But the Americans serve any interests except for their own. Or can you tell me where it is in the interest of the American people to have more than 150 military bases in foreign countries? All over the world. war going on in Iraq, in Afghanistan, uh, in Sudan in Mali, I don't know, Libya, uh, where they all are, where does that serve any interest of the common American people? It's, it's just the same thing like, like in Germany. The urge to serve foreign interests, even if only possible by abandoning national interests, and, and you do that because you, you abandon all your national interests to your social security. Now when you see this Obamacare, stuff coming up. Um, this sickness is geographically limited to the German territory. I could say that's also limited to the United States territory. The people are so easily betrayed into this, into the slogans and, and, and well, it, uh, it physically hurts me, you know, to see that the thing that Bismarck said more than a hundred years ago uh, is not only accountable for the Germans, but also a lot for the Americans. And understand, we we make this make this we got to make this real clear that during Bismarck during that era, they they ousted the Jesuits. They kicked they kicked the, the Jesuits out of Germany. Yeah, Bismarck made a law that kicked the Jesuits out of Germany in 1872 after founding the nation state in 1871, and that law was abolished. Guess in what kind in what year? Walt, you know it still? 1917, wasn't it? Yeah, exactly the year when the Americans entered the, uh, the First World War. Funny coincidence, isn't it? Now, 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 let's make a little connection here. Let's make a little connection so people can understand that this is not a theory. This is conspiracy, but not a theory. I know but, you can look it up. What we're talking about here is, you see, when you look, when you understand the history of the Jesuits, they've been kicked out of 80 some countries, and most of them were Catholic countries. Now, the only country that they have not been kicked out of is the United States of America. And that's why we've been covering it on Sundays, because this. The, the the original 13 colonies, this, this, this was a, a, a Christian-based country. But in 1776, 
the Jesuits fomented the American Revolution through the Freemasons. The reason why the Jesuits have not been kicked out of this country is because they fomented the American Revolution, they founded the American Revolution, and they own it. They run, they run the Federal Reserve. And, and so, so what is the connection between the United States and Germany? It's the 46 million Germans that are in this country are a bit, are a part of the, part of the equation. And the, the equation that they're trying to stamp out is they, they want to stamp out the Reformation, all signs of Protestantism. That, that is, that, because, because for the first time, you know, I, I'm still, I, I, you know, is the, is this, is, is World War One, and and how it got started, and and, and you know, because to to understand another place where we're going to be going is to understand Israel. You have to understand the first and the second Reich, and you have to understand the third Reich to understand. If it wasn't for the third Reich, if it wasn't for the Nationalist Socialist Party, we wouldn't had an Israel. Now that's going to be covered in a later broadcast, but anyway, that's my comments. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. There's also some uh, other very interesting point that I like to quote here, and uh, then maybe you can play this little um, this little tape from uh, C. T. Wilcox. From C. T. Wilcox. Yes, sorry, I forget his name. Um, but just to finish up with what I read about the German Empire, you have to see for 30 years, and that is the German Empire between 1871 and 1918. For 30 years, Germany struggled against Britain to be Europe's leading industrial power, though both fell behind the United States. Representative of Germany's industry was the steel giant Krupp, whose first factory was built in Essen. By 1902, the factory alone became a great city with its own streets, its own police force, fire department, and traffic laws. There are 150 kilometers of rail, 60 different factory buildings, 8,500 machine tools, seven electrical stations, 140 kilometers of underground cable, and 46 overhead. Under Bismarck, Germany was a world innovator in building and wel the welfare state. German workers enjoyed health, accident, and maternity benefits, canteens, changing rooms, and the national pension scheme. Why am I reading this to you? Because we also, in this broadcast, have to go once into the, uh, into the oath of the Jesuits. And when you know what the Jesuits are swearing in that oath, you will see that they are sent into prospering liberal countries that are enjoying the arts and a good economy and live in peace. And that is just what Germany did with the Second Empire. So, now, maybe you can play now this uh, part from Wilcox. Oh, okay. He's got his name right, yeah. <laughs> yeah. He, yeah, this this is just a little, sh a little short clip here. I'm going I'm to... Your, your book deals heavily with Abraham Lincoln and with what is called euphemistically now the Civil War, the war between the states. I think you and I agree that it probably was an international war, that it was fomented internationally, financed most certainly out of Europe, and was part of a scheme designed to lay to waste the American experiment, which would have been a huge threat to the European power and money interests. Here, let me, let me give you a quote from German Chancellor Otto von Bismarck discussing that entire period uh, of American history. He says that the division of the United States into federations of equal force was decided long before the Civil War by the high financial powers of Europe. These bankers were afraid that the United States, if they remained in one block and as one nation, would attain economic and financial independence, which would in turn upset their, their financial dominion over Europe. 
and the world. Of course, in the inner circle of finance, the voice of the Rothschilds prevailed. They saw an opportunity for prodigious booty if they could substitute two feeble democracies burdened with debt to the financiers in place of a vigorous republic sufficient unto herself. Therefore, they sent their emissaries into the field to exploit the question of slavery and to drive a wedge between the two parts of the Union. The rupture between the North and South became inevitable. The masters of European finance employed all their forces to bring it about and to turn it to their advantage. And Abraham Lincoln realized this. He knew that the Rothschilds, who hold the official title of guardian of the Vatican Treasury, by the way, that's kind of the linkage to the Vatican there. He stated the money power, meaning the Rothschilds and the Jesuits, preys upon the nation in times of peace and conspires against it in times of adversity. It is more despotic than monarchy, more insolvent than autocracy, more selfish than bureaucracy. I see in the near future a crisis approaching that unnerves me and causes me to tremble for the safety of my country. Corporations have been enthroned. An era of corruption will follow and the money power of the country will endeavor to prolong its reign by working upon the prejudices of the people until the wealth is aggregated in the hands of a few people and the republic is destroyed. That is exactly the situation you have right now. Yeah, it's completely uh, prophetic. Yeah, totally. And you, let's go back now and maybe you can help me pull some threads together. So we have the monarchical powers the, the, in, in Europe. We have the Rothschilds, who are the bankers to the Pope and also the bankers to the Crown of England. Is that not correct? Right. And bankers to the United States. Because you've got to remember that the, the U.S. banking system, as it stands right now, is nothing more than an arm of the Bank of England. It's a branch off. Power goes... Your taxes ultimately go to the Vatican. If you really want to get down to, mm -hmm. down to the brass tax, right? Uh, the, the IRS collects on behalf of Federal Reserve System. They take that money, ship it across the Atlantic to England. England then ships it to the Vatican, right? And that's how the, you know, the, the Vatican uh, is, turns around and is able to buy up this, that, and everything else. All these, you know, land holdings and real, the real estate, the businesses, you know, they're in all kinds of booze, right? You go into a liquor store and you buy Benedictine. What do you think? <laughs> exactly. You know, I mean, come on. Uh, yeah, so the, all these enterprises, and the, you know, uh, and then you have these orders like like the Jesuits that take a lot of that money and become majority shareholders in the Bank of America and you know other other banks and 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 uh, so that's kind of how all that that whole circle. Okay, can you can you hear me now? Yes. Anyway, uh, I uh, I listen. Excuse us for. Uh the unprofessional <laughs> sound man here, but uh, did uh, w w you were able to hear it pretty good on your end, uh, Yerk? Yeah, yeah, I heard it fine once it started. Just when a little bit starting problem, you know, but that's no big problem. Yes. We are no Alex Jones with a million dollar studio, you know. That that's a very good comment. I mean, yes, we we don't have a we're not going to have a million dollar drive to so we can rebuild our 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 studio. I mean. Uh, we are making do uh, with what we have, you know. So anyway, yeah, I think I think that the listener who cannot forgive this little fault that we are having uh, is wrong here anyway to listen to this. Well, yes, yes, yes. Uh, so anyway, uh, listen. Anyway, uh, that that was uh, the comment that uh, uh, C C T Wilcox made. Yeah, it was quite quite interesting what uh, what he yes, said. Yes, yes. You know. Uh, in other words, it's 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 like uh, when you start seeing seeing this, you see that uh, the you know it's always in some circles that people think that all these wars are started by the Jews, the Jewish bankers in Rothschild. The Rothschilds are just the bankers. Oh, the Vatican, the war bankers of the Vatican. They're the war bankers. I mean, they're the ones. They're the ones that finance the wars. They're the ones they, that, that. Yeah, they are the keepers of the here, guardians here. of the Vatican treasure. That's right. That's right. And then and all, the guardian is not the owner. Yes, and 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 the guardian is not the owner. That's right. He is just guarding the gold. Who has the gold makes the rules, and who makes the rules is the papacy, the Jesuit papacy. 
Well, we're getting down. We have about five minutes. Do you have something you'd like to close with, uh, Jörg? Yeah, maybe it's a little bit interesting to come into the um, uh, the clash of the cultures uh, that happened uh, during this second uh, Reich that we were talking about. Um, uh, some interesting numbers are also mentioned in there. Um, like, for example, in Prussia in 1871 included 16 million Protestants, both Reformed and Lutheran, and 8 million Catholics. Most people were generally segregated into their own religious world, living in rural districts or city neighborhoods that were overwhelmingly uh, of the same religion, and sending their children to separate republic, uh, public schools where their religion was taught. Okay. Um, there was little interaction or uh, intermarriage. On the whole, the Protestants had a higher social status, and the Catholics were more likely to be peasant farmers or unskilled or semi-skilled industrial workers in the 18. 70, the Catholics formed their own political party, the Center Party. So that's formed in 1870. And that Center Party is what we today call in Germany the CDU. The Christian, they call themselves that, but they are as Christian as the Pope is. Um, the Christian Democratic Union, that is the party of this devilish, satanic Angela Merkel. Chancellor since 2005 or whatever, or 2008, I don't know. Too long anyway. Well, and also, too, Yerk, if you put her name into the search engines and put Pope behind it and then hit images, you'll see that she has been to the Vatican many, many times. Yes. Yes, she is. Hmm. She is, excuse my language, a bitch to the Pope. <laughs> yeah. Uh, <laughs> uh, that's... <laughs> Excuse me for losing it here. <laughs> but, uh, we have but yes, yes, yes. I mean, in uh, that. We, and, and by the way, to uh, listeners, if you want to do a search on the on the on the prime minister of Brazil or the president of Brazil, and and then do Pope, and then do a search, you'll find that all these leaders have been to the Vatican. You know, you know, they haven't been to Israel to visit the Jews. You know, it's not, you know. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good point, Walt. Yes. <laughs> That's a good point. Yeah. Nobody kisses the feet of Netanyahu. <laughs> no, no, no. They kissed the ring, uh, you know. And also, I, I, an email was sent to me uh, this morning. Uh, the Pope, the, there's a picture it's a very good picture. They've cleaned, they're trying to portray the new Pope as a down-to-earth, down-home, town-home boy. He's taken off the red shoes, and I, I mean, he's just a down-home boy. You know, he's, you know, uh, but understand, when they take him to the crowd, so they put him in a bulletproof uh, uh, limousine, you know. Uh, they, they got the Pope mobile, you know. They didn't have that for JFK, you know. They took, the, he was in a convertible. Uh, say so, well, anyway. Listen, I, we're run out of time, so uh, uh, I'm, we we have a broadcast on Sundays. Go to Grand Design Exposed, and you'll see uh, the Jesuits derooting the Reformation. A link to this this page, and also we have uh, uh, three other calls there, and uh, lots of audio to listen to. And we'd appreciate any information that you can share with us. And also, if you'd like to be a, a guest sometime on the broadcast, please send us an email at feedback at granddesignexposed.com. So with that, we're going to sign off. Uh, uh, you, you know, I, I think I'm going to close this broadcast out uh, uh, with with a song. We're going to we're going to we're going to on on the on the light side. We're going to we're going to. Uh, Finish it off with a song, and then we'll 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 cancel at the end. Okay. Uh, okay. Okay. Thanks very much for having this broadcast tonight, and uh, to our listeners, I say, always do your own research. Never believe what we say. Check it all. Uh, everything you want to find is to be found on the internet or in the library, in books, not in the television. But study it for yourself. Don't believe us. Don't take our word for it. But on the other hand, when you prove that something that we said was right, um, 
it is also nice sometimes to get a positive feedback on that, and we are always grateful for that. So you can send an email to the address that Walt just said, or you can contact me via my uh, YouTube channel, where the link is on the site of this um, broadcast that we do. And for the rest, I want to say thank you very much, and good night, and God bless you.